Let's have a look at the results of what we did in the Benchwork Basics session. If you remember, I um, showed you a method of getting dried, stubborn uh, sodium alginate out of the cloth because we had crispy bits on that and I could see it on the surface and I, I'm pretty sure the camera picked that up. Well, that's now gone. I took it from its hot soda soap bucket and I threw it into the machine and I carried on washing it at 60 degrees. It went on the line, dried, and I've now ironed it. So, hasn't altered the course of history much. And what I'm going to show you is what the colour of the water was. So, one second. That was the colour of the water. And I think we can see, it looked a bit scary in the bucket. It looked, oh my God, like a, a dark dye bath. But the tint on that really is not going to take much, make much difference at all to what was already there. So that was a method of getting rid of stubborn print paste from this piece. And if you remember over here, let me switch to the other side, it'll probably be easier. Over here, I put this piece of cloth unrinsed straight into a bucket of pretty hot soda ash to deliberately see what any live dye left would do to the white on the fabric. And I asked Andrew to say, well, what sort of colour did he think it was going to be? And he said, oh, a sort of violety colour. And he wasn't far off. And for me, this just demonstrates that although the blue dye is a small molecule, it's a slow molecule. So if we look at what the colour of the water was, it is indeed a kind of strange pale mauve. But on the cloth, it's actually reading slightly towards a a blue, pale, pale lilac. Now, if you decide to deliberately backstain your cloth, please pay attention to the colours within it, because of course you can end up with a very pale neutral, which may not go with what you've done at all. So think about it. This one I rinsed by hand. It was a small piece of cloth, um, not worth putting in the washing machine. And these were the liquid dyes that I used the Cola pen with and the Montana marker. Um, so easy to wash because liquid dyes, no print paste to get rid of. Moving on, this is the one that I started to do the dry brushing with, uh, with the liquid dyes. And again, I washed that in the bucket on its own, couple of cold, couple of hot, and that was pretty much it. Here, we worked wet on wet. So this was a Thermofax print and we can see the bleedy effects. Can't remember what that was. Oh, it was a foam brush. So that was a line of foam brush and this was using the foam brush as a stamp. Here I used paint brushes in a couple of different reds, uh, paint brush again in yellow, and we can see the nice bleed effects. And down here, I sprayed it with liquid dyes. So some very interesting effects you can get with wet on wet. This was our screen printing using the breakdown screen. I didn't touch the bottom, that was already the gray color but I'm beginning now to build up this, this top section and I will do more work on it. And finally, we have the sacrificial lamb, the piece of cloth that tells you just what some of these really cheap tools can do. We, you know, we had the funny little washing up thing. We had a bit of uh, square shaped foam. We had the sauce bottles that the dyes are in. We had needle nose bottles. We had rollers. We had letter forms. We had foam brushes used as a stamp. Lots and lots of stuff. And I have to say, I love these in their black and white form, or in this instance, in their cream and white form. And Andrew said to me, oh, what are you going to do with that one? And I said, well, I don't know, we could do all sorts of stuff to it. We could scrape it, we could over dye it, we could chop it up into six inch squares and have fun reassembling it. And that can be a fantastic project. And he said, oh, they'd make really good napkins. So these are going to get chopped up and Andrew's going to take them home as napkins. So happy endings there. So I encourage you, it does take a little bit of effort to set up a working space to do bench work, but uh, you will be re well rewarded with uh, taking that time and effort. And you might be looking at this and thinking, well, I'm not really a surface designer and 
I like to chop up my fabrics and put them back together again and make quilts. No problem at all. But just ask yourself when you're building your palette of cloth, okay, you may be doing a lot of work in the bucket or the washing machine to get your values and your colors and your textures and your solids, but you might want some what I would call graphic cloth to go with that. So you may create yourself something with a lot of scribble marks on it, linear grids, uh, blocky type of stuff like this or spots. So you've just got that option quilt makers of creating your own patterned cloth as opposed to having to buy it. So have a lot of fun with this. Hi, I'm Claire Ben a textile artist based in the UK and together with Galley Publishing I've put together a wonderful new workshop called Exploring Fibre Reactive Dyes. Over the next several hours we're going to explore how to get the most from your fibre reactive dyes, whether that's dyeing a palette of cloth for quilt making, creating layered compositional cloth, dyeing fabric for doll making, backgrounds for embroidery, wearables or even soft furnishings will cover the basics of getting you well on your way towards making terrific fabrics. Let's have a look at what's covered. In part one, Claire gives an overview to the whole workshop, including some of the key highlights of what you can expect to learn. In part two, we take a look at cloth and its preparation for dyeing. Natural fibers that work well with fiber reactive dyes include silk, cotton, rayon, hemp, linen, bamboo, cane, rattan, or mixtures thereof. In part three, we explore the role of the different ingredients used in the process of fiber reactive dyeing, as well as how to manipulate these ingredients to suit our studio and local climate. Part four sees us starting to dye the cloth, beginning with bucket dyeing. Claire has organized a series of bucket-based dye methods that are designed to create both smooth and textured results. We work with high water and low water dye methods, and then move on to tray dyeing for texture and dyeing a serial gradation developing a tonal palette with a single color of dye. We explore using a washing machine to dye our fabrics, a favorite method of Claire's, as it produces smooth, even results. An element of this demonstration is over dyeing existing colors. In part five, we move on to bench work, where we'll learn how to transform the dyes into paints and use them creatively in a series of included projects. We learn how to prepare our cloth with sodium carbonate, which is a fixative, we produce our very own liquid dye paints and thicken dye paints and learn how to adjust both the value or tonality and consistency of these paints. In part six, we enjoy a playful series of surface design projects, each designed to illustrate and teach a particular method of using dye paints. We begin working with black dye on white fabric, where the emphasis is on technique and learning a variety of ways of getting dye onto the cloth. From there, it's on to screen printing, where silk screens and thermofax screens are used to demonstrate a variety of wonderful effects. Next is scraping, a magnificently simple technique that enables you to create marks and as well over dye the cloth in sections or entirety. Claire shows how liquid dye paints can be used with distressed paint brushes, cola pens, and with refillable Montana markers for even more interesting mark making and calligraphy and graffiti type effects. In part seven, we dive deep into color exploration. We begin by using a set of basic colors and create a color chart or tartan, an exciting and immediate way of seeing how different dye colors affect each other. From there, we move on to color mixing, starting with secondary colors and explore complex colors, such as rust orange or petrol green. We explore neutrals or tonal values that work well with all colors, as well as examining black as a color in its own right and creating many shades of gray. In part eight, we look at the results of our over dyeing projects and explore how Claire has used fiber reactive dyes on a variety of fabrics for a stunning range of effects. Claire completes the workshop with some great ideas of where to go next and provides a total of 18 learning projects in the written study guide to keep you busy for weeks or months of explorations. All in all, more than seven hours of instructional high-definition video combined with a 100-page ebook, 
providing you with the knowledge, practice, and recipes to ensure equally stunning results in your dye studio. Please join us by ordering your copy of Exploring Fibre Reactive Dyes from Galley Publishing.